Hello everybody, my name is Philip and I am the gameplay designer for Chroma, Bloom and Blight. I want to take you through the basics of the game today. We're going to start by talking about the deck builder and how mana works. And then we're going to jump into an actual game so I can show you how to play. You can skip to the second part by going to the timestamp on the screen. First, you need to know that Chroma is a traditional card game. That means you play in a one-on-one -on -one match against another player using decks of cards that you build yourself. You can build decks of cards in the deck builder. In the deck builder, you will find 240 cards at release. These cards are all available for free. You do not have to pay for anything and there are no cards missing. On top of these 240 cards, there are also 22 heroes. You can select your heroes up here in the top left corner. Click on this icon and then you will see this screen. In here you can choose from 22 different heroes to build your deck with. Now heroes are really important because they have a variety of different attributes that significantly impact the deck building process. The first are their abilities. You can see here that every hero has three different abilities. A primary ability, a secondary ability, and an ultimate. We will talk about how to use these later. What's important right now is their mana pool. Up here you can see that every hero has a distinct mana pool available to them. Every hero has 12 mana total available for deck building. Let me go ahead and select a hero. We have selected Pridemonger. Pridemonger's mana pool is 6 insight and 6 valor. You can see this in the bottom left corner. Now you can see your mana curve up here. By adding mana into the mana pool like this, you can build your own mana curve. And this will be the order in which you gain mana during a match. Now, what is mana used for? Mana is used for playing cards. So you can see on the right here that the game already filtered out all of the cards that this hero can't play due to her mana pool. If we undo this filter, you can see that there are many more cards available, but they use different kinds of mana. You can see what kind of mana a card uses up here. So for example, your story ends uses one neutral mana and one ambition mana. Neutral mana can be paid for using any color of mana available to your hero, while ambition mana can only be paid for using green mana, ambition mana. The same is true for all cards. So for example, this card right here, A Song for Dancing, requires two devotion mana to be played. Now this is where it gets a little bit awkward with our hero. If I want to play A Song for Dancing, I can't, because if you have a look at our hero's mana pool, she doesn't have access to any purple mana. She doesn't have access to devotion mana. So let's undo this filter again, and now we can see all of the cards that are available to play for our hero. These cards are all inside and Valor cards. Your hero provides you with the mana needed to play cards. So to give an example right here, our Pride Monger has access to six Valor as well as six inside mana. You can determine yourself during deck building in which order you will gain your mana. So you can see right now, for example, we would gain one blue mana on turn one, another blue mana on turn two, and a third blue mana on turn three. If we want to switch this up, I can change it. So now we would be gaining a red mana on turn 4, then another blue mana on turn 5, and then maybe a red mana on turn 6 and on turn 7. This is entirely up to you, and how you build your mana curve has a big impact on the kind of deck you're playing. For example, right now we're gaining a blue mana on turn 1, 2, and 3. That means we are able to play Fists Filled with Light on turn 3. This is very powerful, but it comes at a cost, because now we are not able to play any Valor cards within those first three turns. The earliest we will be able to play a Valor card is on turn four, because that's when we're gaining our first Valor mana. Keeping these mana costs in mind is very important to deck building. Now, this is a skill that's going to require some time to acquire, so for now, we have included six starter decks in the game for you that you can use 
to just immediately start playing and learning the game. They're designed to be played in order, and the complexity of the starter decks ramps up with each consecutive one. So please start with starter deck 1 and then move your way upwards from there. For our purposes, we are going to be playing the Siege Baron deck starter deck 4. We're going to play a game against the bot. Now, the bots aren't super smart. They make some silly mistakes sometimes, but for learning the game, that is perfectly fine. We're going to be playing Siege Baron and we're playing against Minerva. We win by getting our opponent to zero health. The first decision you have to make in a game of Chroma is whether or not you're going to keep your hand of cards or if you're going to mulligan it. Keeping it means that this will be your starting hand, while mulliganing will result in you getting an entirely new hand of cards. I think for our purposes, we're going to shuffle back this hand. So you can see, we now have four new cards instead of our initial four cards. There are many different types of cards in Chroma. There are spells, enchantments, companions, landmarks, and enchantment companions. We're going to start by talking about companions. So let's go ahead and pass over the turn to the bot, who immediately plays an enchantment. How convenient. You can see that in our hand, we have Living Rampart. This is a companion. It costs one devotion and one neutral mana to play. We already talked about mana earlier, but as you can see, we have one devotion and one valor mana in our current mana pool, which means we are using the valor mana to pay for the neutral mana cost. When playing a companion, you can choose which page of the story you're placing it in. This is true for all permanents. Pages are these individual lanes or cells or blocks, whatever you want to call it, on the board. We call them pages. I'm going to play the Living Rampart in the center page. You can see that the Living Rampart has the spikes around it. That means that this companion has taunt. There's going to be a separate video talking about all of the different keywords. But for now, let's just worry about the basics. Let me go ahead and end my turn. Our opponent plays a companion. That's great. That gives me an opportunity to kind of show off how companions fight. You can see that this companion used an ability when it entered the story that dealt free damage to our living rampart. And now it only has one health remaining. Once the health of a companion drops to zero, it is destroyed and goes into the ashes. You can attack either the enemy hero or an opposing companion. For our purposes right now, we're going to attack the opposing companion. As you can see, both companions destroyed each other. That's because when companions fight, they both deal their attack in damage to the opposing companion's health. That means since both of them only had one health and more than one attack, both of them got destroyed. Now let's take a second to talk about enchantments. Enchantments are also permanents and also enter the story when played. You can see over here, this Bountiful Harvest is an enchantment. Enchantments can't be attacked and they don't participate in combat in any way. They do still take up a space on the story though. Enchantments also have what's called a span value. You can see this down here. At the start of the player's turn, who controls the enchantment, the span value will tick down by 1. And once it reaches 0, the enchantment is destroyed. This means that this particular card right here, the Bountiful Harvest, will stay on the board for 10 turns, which is quite long. Now there's also a sort of combination of enchantments and companions called an enchantment companion. For example, Radiance right here. An enchantment companion has both attack and health as well as a span. And if they run out of health, then they remain on the board as an enchantment. But if they run out of span, then they get fully destroyed. This can be very beneficial, but it can also be a bit of a downside. This depends a bit on the specific card. Now, in this turn, we still have two mana remaining, which is a great opportunity to use our hero's primary ability. You can see right here, it costs two neutral mana and says discard a card, then draw a card. If I click this button, you can now see, ah, okay, I can choose one of my cards to discard. Let me go ahead and discard this Batnash because this has a nice synergistic effect, which lets it enter the story after being discarded, and then we draw a card. You can use most heroes' primary ability once per turn. Every hero also has a secondary ability. 
These vary a lot. Oftentimes they are passives or a bit conditional and synergize with your primary ability. These two abilities are available to your hero from the very beginning of the game. Every hero also has an ultimate ability. This right here. Ultimates are very powerful, but can only be used a single time each match. Ultimates can also only be used after the game has entered Act 3. We're going to talk about how the Act system works in just a little bit. But this seems to be just about as good a time as any to pass our turn, since we are out of mana and none of our companions can attack yet. It is now our opponent's turn and they play a big scary companion, but the bots aren't very smart <laughs> and it uh, manages to disarm itself. But then to protect the companion, the bot moves it into the guarded stance. This is a great moment to let me teach you about the guarded stance. Every companion can switch between the combat stance and guarded stance once per turn if they haven't attacked yet. This is important. After a companion attacks, they can't switch between the stances anymore. Now, the combat stance is what you have seen so far. A companion in the combat stance can simply go and attack freely, which is nice. It's good to be able to keep momentum on the board. It lets you fight off opposing companions and it lets you deal damage to your opponent, which will hopefully help you win the game. A companion in the guarded stance, however, can't attack but it also can't be attacked, and that is very important. You can see right here this Ataraxi is a companion our opponent played, and usually I would be able to attack it just fine with our Batnash and destroy it. However, because it is in the guarded stance, I cannot attack it. In fact, I can only attack the opposing hero. Now, I might say, you know what? Actually, I want to protect my companion as well, and I switch it into the guarded stance. I can do so, by clicking this button up here. Now our companion is in the guarded stance. You can see it can't attack anymore, but it is now also protected from opposing attacks. An important thing to keep in mind here is that companions in the guarded stance are only protected from attacks. They are in no way protected from spells. So for example, Forgotten right here will still destroy this companion without any problems since guarded stance offers no protection from spells or abilities. To end our turn, let's use our primary ability one more time, see what we can find here. Oh, that's a very good card. And then move on. It's our opponent's turn. Oh, it seems that they didn't have anything they could play. That's very nice for us. Gives us an opportunity to really start being aggressive. You can see that our companion that we put into the guarded stance earlier is still on the guarded stance. If I now toggle it out of the guarded stance into the combat stance, it can attack immediately. This is a bit more of an advanced mechanic, but important to keep in mind that companions have summoning sickness. So when they enter the story the first time, they can't attack immediately. As long as a companion is in the combat stance at the end of your turn once, that summoning sickness is gone for the rest of their time in the story which means that you can then toggle them into the guarded stance and attack freely with them. This is, again, a bit more of an advanced mechanic, but it is still important to keep in mind. You may notice that our Badnosh just took a point of damage, so did our Radiance earlier. That's because Minerva has the secondary ability, which is a passive. The first time each turn you are attacked, deal one damage to the attacker. This allows her to protect herself and uh, fight back against the some some aggressive companions looking at the board here i think we want to continue building it up so let me go ahead and play the bloom vagrant which spawns additional companions and then we again want to use our primary ability as often as we can because it's just a very nice very powerful effect to demonstrate what i was talking about with the combat and guarded stance i'm going to switch our bloom vagrant into the guarded stance right now and then next turn you will see that it can't attack immediately. Oh, there's a, a bit of a companion, nothing too scary from our opponent, as well as using the primary ability. The selection takes a little bit, you know, gotta think. <laughs> and here we go. Deals two damage to one, wait, deals one damage to two different targets. 
The companion toggled into the guarded stance again. This is a common strategy because as you can see, this will now keep the spirit conservator alive. I am not able to attack it. Talking about attacking, remember this Bloom Vagrant I toggled into the guarded stance earlier. If I toggle it out of the guarded stance into the combat stance, it is not able to attack right now because it was never in the combat stance at the end of your turn. Well then, I think it's time to talk about the act system. Every match of Chroma is structured into three distinct acts. There are two ways to transition from Act 1 into Act 2 and also two ways to transition from Act 2 into Act 3. The first one is the Act Counter. You can see it over here on the left side. As this tooltip explains, the Act Counter decreases after every card played and every turn ended. When it reaches zero, the game will move into the next act at the end of the turn. So after I play a card, let's say I want to play this Brutal Regulator, you can see that the act counter decreased by one. If I end my turn, you will yet again see that it goes down by one. Once the act counter reaches zero, the game will transition into act two at the end of the current player's turn. Now, there's also a secondary way of getting into act two, and that is breaking your opponent's first barrier. You can see on the opponent's health bar, there are two barriers. This is the first barrier and this is the second barrier. There's a pretty long tooltip on that. These are in the game to kind of help you understand how to play the game uh, when you're playing it for the first time. You can go into the options menu and reduce the tooltip length there, if that's something you're looking for. The way barriers work is that they will protect your hero from damage. So for example, if I take my bad nosh and attack, you will see our opponent now has 31 life left. If I then take this brutal regulator and attack our opponent again, we should deal six damage. Instead, we are going to deal one damage and break the first barrier. This has two effects. First, the protection effect we just talked about. But secondly, it also moves the act counter to zero, as you can see. Because after the first barrier of either hero is broken, the game will move into Act 2 at the end of the turn, no matter what the Act Counter currently is. So if I end my turn now, you can see that we are now moving into Act 2. In Act 2, both players gain access to two additional neutral mana. The mana your hero usually has is colored mana. So in our case, that is devotion and valor. In our opponent's case, that is insight, devotion and ambition. However, the two additional mana you gain in Act 2 are neutral mana only. So looking at this board now, I think we can feel a little worried. There's a lot our opponent has going on. Now, we are trying to get our opponent down to 0 HP. That is how we win the game. So let's maybe try and attack our opponent first. Very good. And then clear this board with a big spell effect. A spell is a card that you can play a single time. It has an immediate effect. And then it's just gone. They don't stick around on the board. They have their one-time use. And then that's it. Now we're out of mana here, so maybe let's use our primary ability again. You may notice that I'm using this effect a lot, and honestly speaking, you should probably try and use your abilities as much as possible, since that is what the heroes are kind of designed around. That's what they are there to do. You can see our opponent just played what's called a mark. Markings are effects that are directly placed on pages. So you can see right here, for example, this marking says, at the start of your turn, give companions in this page spell power plus one, deadly or warded, rotating each turn. So don't worry too much about the keywords right now. As I mentioned, there will be a separate video for that. But this is something that affects the page, the story directly, and is something that will affect any companion I place in this page. So, for example, if I want to play this Ghost of Goodwill here, at the start of my next turn, it will receive one of these buffs. Looking at this board, I think we're feeling really good. We have um, nothing that immediately threatens us. Our opponent played an enchantment, but that enchantment isn't very dangerous. So let's maybe go ahead and see if we can continue filtering our deck for the good cards. 
play ourselves a Bloom Vagrant and this seems about as good an opportunity as any to use our secondary ability for the first time. This ability says deal 1 damage to any target for every 5 cards in your ashes. We currently have 14 cards in our ashes, so this will deal 2 damage. Very good. Now, remember what I said about transitioning from Act 1 into Act 2. The same thing can be done in terms of transitioning from Act 2 into Act 3. You can see up here, we have a second barrier. This one breaks at 15 health. And over here, the act counter is already only at 16. We're going to try and get ourselves into the position where we can break that barrier as quickly as possible. So let me go ahead and use my primary again. Get rid of that. Let's see if we can find something fun here. Maybe play another card. This is just a good and powerful spell. You can see we now have a really good amount of board control. Play the Ghost of Goodwill. Use our secondary ability again, which will deal free damage now. And then we just start our assault. Very good. This will put our opponent down to 15 life. Keep that in mind. The barrier will prevent the overkill damage. And then we are going into Act 3. Now, in Act 3, both heroes gain access to their ultimate ability. The ultimate, as I already mentioned, is a very powerful effect that can only be used once for the entire game. After you use it, it's gone. So be careful with it. You don't want to waste it. Alright, it's our turn again. Very good. So, we're going to attack our opponent. As... The goal is still to put her to uh, zero life. But as you can see, we're kind of out of stuff. Uh, we don't have any more damage right now. And this is a scary enchantment. And I'm kind of worried about this. Now, I'm going to be completely honest. I'm not actually worried about that. I just want to show off my beautiful ultimate ability. So as I already mentioned, every hero has an ultimate. These are uh, very important effects that uh, you really should uh, make sure that you can use efficiently. We'll play our Ghost of Goodwill and then maybe just use the secondary again. Oh, there we go. That was already four damage. It seems we managed to fill up our ashes with enough stuff. And with that, we win. Before we finish up this video, I want to show you guys landmarks. We sadly didn't get an opportunity to show them off last game. So I went into the debugger mode and uh, cheated them into my hand. Don't worry about it. This is nothing that can be done in multiplayer in any shape or form. So, we have the first temple and we have the Boundless Spire. These are two landmarks. Landmarks also enter the story, but they are a bit different from the other types of permanents because they affect both players. So, for example, right here you can see the first temple says, All companions have taunt. Taunt, right here, being indicated by these spikes. You will see when our opponent plays a companion, this effect applies to them too. It's not just on us. That's what makes landmarks special. They are a bit more neutral than uh, other types of permanents. They are also very difficult to destroy. So, for example, uh, you can see right here, this landmark has 6 plating and the first temple has 12 plating, which is a ton. Plating is a value that you can only deal one damage to at a time. It does work like health, so you can attack it and deal damage to it with spells and abilities. But if you deal 100 damage to something with plating, you will get rid of one plating. Meaning, to destroy the first temple, you need to deal damage 12 times which is very difficult. So landmarks are very sturdy, but you really need to be careful in your deck construction so you don't accidentally buff your opponent. I hope this video helped you getting started with Chroma, Bloom and Blight. I hope you like the game. I spent a lot of time working on all of the different gameplay elements and honestly, I'm really proud of them. So uh, I hope you're willing to give them a shot. Anyway, thank you very much for watching this video and I'll see you guys in the game.